Well, here we are. What a blessing. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. I believe this is our fourth part in the series here. And we're going to begin again looking at the power of the Lamb, the profundity of the power of the Lamb. We've been dissecting the truth or Trinity. So here we go. Wonderful source text, Daniel chapter 7, in the ninth verse. We're so familiar with it. I saw until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garments was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. As we've progressed along with this teaching, we've discovered that there is an echad compound plurality, that the biblical reality of truth is plural monotheism, the echad plura plurality, that there are two powers in heaven, Yahuwah, one concealed and one revealed as the face, the right arm, the back, and Yahusha. The greater and lesser as far as the compound unity. Not greater in personage, because that's a Trinitarian doctrine personage, but we're looking at power. It is the plurality of power. So what we see here in Daniel, the paradigm of a high sovereign Yahuwah who rules heaven and he rules earth through the agency of a second appointed Yahuwah. Yahuwah is both sovereign and vice regent, occupying, if you will, both slots, as it were, the head of the divine council of Elohim. And you see that in Psalm 82, right? So we have two Yahuwahs. Now, people would check out at this point and go, well, that's polytheism. No, we're talking about a com pound unity, the echad plurality of divinity. One invisible, one spirit, the other visible, often in human form. The two Yahuwahs at times appear together in the same text as we discovered yesterday and at times being distinguished and at other times not. Now this is not a violation of plural monotheism. Let me be very clear. Now, of course, on social media, people are so quick to take a snippet of a video or something produced by this ministry and then rip it out of context, and they won't include this section right now where I'm really nailing it down for us that this is not a violation of plural monotheism. Why? <coughs> Since Either figure is indeed the creator, Yahuwah. There is no, let me be very clear on this, there is no second distinct God running around the cosmos. There is not. This is plural monotheism. Is Yahusha the creator? Yes. yes. Is Yahuwah the creator, the bara? Yeah. Yes. So there we have it. It's very clear. Mark chapter 2, verse 6, it is written. Now some of the scribes were sitting there and questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak thus? This is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but Elohim alone? So Yahusha, in that text, is accused of forgiving sins, fulfilling the words of the scribes. He was forgiving sins, not just right there in the front of the scribes in the New Testament narrative. He was forgiving sins all the way back in the Exodus. Exodus, Shemot, chapter 33, verse 18, it is written. He then said, please, 
Show me your kavod. Show me your glory. And Yahweh said, I shall make all my goodness pass before you. What has been concealed in the upper dimension, I am going to reveal to you. It is going to be the full power and embodiment of my goodness. And in that revelation, you will find your full redemption because everything of my goodness is revealed. Now, this is where we get the twisted grace-only doctrine. There is so much truth in the grace-only doctrine except it is not understanding the full compound unity because, yes, Yahushua is Yahuwah's goodness, that is going to be revealed in the lower realm, but you cannot divorce that from Yahuwah's justice and legal righteousness where he will not forgive the sins of those that do not repent. And he will not allow you to live in a lawless condition. You see, so you can't just focus on what is revealed in the lower dimension and have it disconnected from what is concealed in the upper dimension. So, here we go. I shall make all my goodness, that is, of course, Yahushua, pass before you. And before you I shall pronounce the name Yahuwah. And I am gracious to those whom I am gracious And I take pity on those on whom I take pity. But my face, that which is in the upper realm that is concealed, you shall not see. It is spirit and it will not be manifest. If you were to see it, you would die. Right? You shall not see. For no human being can see me and survive. And there's no contradiction in Scripture. Then Yahweh said, For you to see me in the lower dimension, you have to be concealed in the cleft of the rock, the broken part of my son. That's the only way you're ever going to experience me, is if I hide you in the broken part, the rock, my son. And then you will see me. But you will only, there is no way to the Father except through the Son. It is so narrow minded. Yes, it is. It's very simple. Enter through the narrow gate. It's that's the theology and truth of the whole Bible. Then Yahweh said in verse 21, here is a place near me, you shall stand upon the rock. Truth or Trinity? Are you going to stand upon the sapphire stone, the rock that is Yahushua? And when my kavod, my glory, that is everything, all my goodness passes before you, I shall put you in the broken part, the cleft of the rock, and shield you with my hand until I have gone past. Have you and I been shielded by the right hand of Yahweh as he has gone past? For sure and for certain. That is called his rachamin, that is called his mercy. Then I shall take my hand away, and you will see my back. That's where the punishment is meted out. The punishment is meted out on the back, but my face will not be seen. This is so level revelation upon the concealed Yahuwah in the upper dimension and the revealed Yahuwah in the lower dimension. This is the distinction between father concealed, son revealed, broken part of the rock where the punishment will be meted out is the safe space where you shall find all of his goodness, forgiveness, grace, mercy, truth, compassion, all of those things that have drawn us to the faith that when we have been the most sick and disgusting and he found us in the gutters. Oh, sorry. (laughs) 
we have a gutter smith in the audience, just in case you guys online are wondering what was that all about. Yes, the gutter smith is now offended and no longer following Torah to the tribes and will be taking to his social media account tonight to trash, get a glamour shot of me and trash it, right? <laughs> I want to know where we get those glamour shots of me from because I don't have them, okay? <laughs> John chapter 1, verse 18, it is written, No one has ever seen Yahuwah, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father He has made known. Th there it is right there, isn't it? John 5, 37, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness to me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. John 6, 46, Not that anyone has seen the Father except him who is from Elohim. He has seen the Father. So nobody... Nobody has seen the hidden Yahuwah. Nobody. He's incapable of being seen since he is Ruach, he is spirit. Although he also knew that many had seen Yahuwah or at least the right arm of Yahuwah, the angel of Yahuwah, the captain of Yahuwah's hosts was seen. The Malachim that came and visited at the Oaks of Mamre, they were seen because that was Yahuwah revealed in the lower dimension. The angel of Yahuwah is mentioned close to 60 times in the scriptures. The revealed Yahuwah, close to 60 times. John 10, verse 29. My Father who gave them to me is greater than than all, and no man is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are echad, a compound unity, and we're in one accord. John 13, verse 16, Amen, ve, amen, I say unto you, the servant, Yahweh revealed in the lower dimension, is not greater than his master, the father, concealed in the upper dimension. One concealed, one revealed, greater and lesser of the compound unity, for my father is greater than I. Ephesians 4, verse 6, One Elohim and father of us all, who is above all and through us all and in you all. Revelation 3, verse 12. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the tabernacle of my Elohim. And he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him the name of my Elohim, and the name of the city of my Elohim, which is the renewed Jerusalem, which comes down out of the heavens from my Elohim, and I will write upon him my renewed name. Can you see the emphasis, the emphasis, the emphasis here on the concealed Yahuwah, my Elohim, the compound unity? Exodus 24, verse 9, And Moshe and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70, th 70 of the elders went up, and they saw the Elohim of Israel. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. And they beheld Elohim. They ate and they drank. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, come up to me on the mountain and wait there. Who did they see up on the mountain? Yahusha, who is the broker, always was the broker of the Malkit Zedek priesthood. Because Yahuwah changes not. It was always Yahusha that was confirming the covenant meal of the Malkit Zedek book of the covenant. As it will be again when you and I sup with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It has always been. There is not some New Testament new thing. But it is a Old Testament 
Tanakh, if you will, reality. So Yahweh is seen, Yahweh is heard, Yahweh has a nice snack, Yahweh has some kiddish. We see this with Moses, we see this with Sarah, we see this with Abraham, we see with, with a host of the prophets also. So my suggestion unto you is this, that there are two Yahweh's, one heavenly and one earthly, one seen and one unseen. It is a duality of powers. Please don't edit that part out. A duality of powers, not personages, please. Not personages demonstrating the Father and the Son, and what is the compound unity? Both bearing the same, and that's why the name is so important, the same name, Yahu, mm -hmm. Yahushua, Yahusha, Yahuwah, the same name, but one is concealed, one, it's not like two different names though. The Elohim of scriptures brings forth the kavod, the glory to himself by the... Of How does he bring glory to himself? It's pretty glorious to conceal yourself, isn't it? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could be invisible? That would be a glorious act. Think what you could do, <laughs> right? <laughs> I am Yahweh and I change not, the prophet Malachi says, as it is reiterated in Hebrews 13. So we see the revealed Yahweh is in fact Yahusha. But the status is unchanging. In the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, he's known as the angel, the Malak of Yahuwah, the captain of Yahuwah's guard, or the concealed Yahuwah's host is revealed as Yahuwah's face or back throughout the scriptures. Genesis 32, verse 30, it is written, And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I have seen... Elohim, Panaim, El Panaim, face to face, and still my life has been preserved. But didn't the Bible just say, if you see my face, you shall die? How can this be so? This is a contradiction in terms to religion, but it is total harmony in the scripture. You see, tradition, paganism, and doctrines of men will always shed light on contradictions that you will not be able to handle. Now, then the straw man is set up, and then people go, oh yeah, the Bible contradicts itself. No, the Bible has no contradictions. It is a perfect tapestry. You just need to flip it over and see the amazing picture from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. Even, the, even those hard texts, they are in perfect, perfect harmony. There is no contradiction in covenants. There's no contradiction in anything. I have never found any. And if I have found something that has confused me, then it is my problem. It is my theology that is wrong. And therefore, I have to take more time to pray, study, meditate, to find out why I'm not seeing the perfect tapestry in Scripture because we see how... How did Jacob see the very face of Yahuwah and not die? Because he said, well, this is kind of profound. It was, of course, the revealed Yahuwah in Yahusha. Exodus 3, verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, the Elohim of Jacob. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon the concealed Yahuwah. Exodus 33, verse 11, And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, Panaim el Panaim, face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. Because what's the full glory, the full goodness of the revealed Yahuwah? He is closer than a brother. Closer than a friend. Exodus 33, verse 20. And he said, you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And Yahweh said, see, there is a place by me, and that you shall stand upon that rock. 
That's how you get to see him. It's always been that way. I mean, I grew up with the Church of England, and in England, there's no separation between church and state. So we had every morning, we had prayer in, in public school. We had a Bible study class. Um, I went to church every Sunday. I sang in the choir. And um, all kinds of things. But was Yahuwah revealed to me? No, I lived a hedonistic lifestyle because he was totally concealed from me, even though I was all around Christianity, the Church of England. Because he can only truly be revealed through Yahushua. That is it. That is it. Numbers 14, verse 14. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that you, Yahuwah, are among this people, that you, Yahuwah, are seen face to face, and that your cloud stands over them, and that you go before them by day in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Deuteronomy 5, verse 44, Yahuwah talk with you face to face, in the mount, out of the midst of the fire. Am I the only one over the years that has wondered about these texts? Face to face, he talks with you. If you see my face, you shall die. You, I mean, am I? Did, did, if, yeah, because I mean, this is like, back in the day, it's like, what? It's the two Yahuwahs, one concealed and the other revealed. To see the face of the concealed Yahuwah would bring death, yet the face of the revealed Yahuwah brings forth salvation, shining as Yahuwah's glory through his back, the part that took the punishment, brings you into the revelation of the Father. Nobody can know the Father except through the Son. So if the synagogue of Satan is trying to teach you through the Hebrew, through the Torah about the Father, can they know the Father without the revealed Yahuwah? It is impossible. So why would you listen to somebody that has got the truth totally concealed from them, what they're teaching you? is what? A religion. It has a form of godliness, yet they deny. Where is the power? The power is in the revealing, in the revelation. And it's a form of godliness because they can tell you all kinds of stories from the Torah. They can talk about, well, Abraham is my father. No, your father is Satan. Yeah. Because you haven't had Yahuwah revealed to you because you deny the son. So you can't teach me about the father. You have a form of godliness. You know Hebrew way better than I do. You can memorize the Torah scroll. You've grown up with little keepers on your head. And you know, great, super fabulous. You have a form of godliness and you deny its power and you are leading the sheep to the slaughter because they're enamored because they think that you understand and you can reveal to them the Father. You can't. The Bible says that is not so. But more and more people have been deceived over the past 10 years through this whole Hebrew Roots Messianic movement. I got to witness it first, first time, and I have to believe, I truly believe that I had to go through that so I could be here to vocalize it so that people don't have to go where I went to go. Because you can enjoy the wonderful fruits of the Torah without getting into that religious nonsense. You truly can. And it is through the revelation of the Malkitzedic priesthood. Because that is the revealed Yahuwah unto his people that then puts you in the safe place, the Malkitzedic priesthood, so you can enjoy the benefits of the Torah and have the full revelation of it. So, Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was and is also in Messiah Yahushua, who being in the very form of Elohim, thought it not presumptuous 
or blasphemous that he is the equal. Very important. The equal of Yahuwah. So remember I said that Yahusha is lesser and the Father is greater. The Bible teaches that. Gave you the scriptures yesterday. But here it says that he is the equal. So what's going on? There is a greater and lesser in power, but equal divinity. Is Yahusha equally divine? Of course, because there's only one Yahuwah as the compound unity. Two Yahuwahs revealed, one revealed, one concealed. But equally, do they carry the same name? Is it one Elohim? Exactly. It's called plural monotheism. So this is the big problem. Religion teaches you about polytheism. Religion teaches you about monotheism. Does religion teach you about plural monotheism? It doesn't. There's the big problem. But the Shema, the watchword of our faith, is the epitome of plural monotheism. And that is why people are like scratching their head, but they're by the egg yolk and uh, shell. No problem. They'll buy the ice water steam. No problem. But then when you actually take them to Deuteronomy 6, 4, and you say, look at the word echad, this is Yahuwah in his compound. You what? I I it's amazing to me. Now, the word here um, to conceal, look at this in Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of Elohim, we all know this, to conceal a matter, but it is the honor of Kings to search out a matter. I shall make you a royal house and a kingdom of priests. In the Malkit said it conceals the Hebrew word sathar, means to, de to destroy, to demolish, to make absent, to eliminate. So the Elohim, if you can bear with me with this, the Elohim of concealment eliminates, look, conceal. Sathar, to destroy, to demolish, bear with me, track with me, to make absent and to eradicate and eliminate. So the Elohim of concealment in the upper dimension destroys and eliminates death and sin through the sovereign act of concealment. Think about that. He has to demolish and destroy things in your life, in my life, in order for glory, kavod, to be revealed. It's the same premise. He has to destroy the darkness in our life, the sin in our life, so that the sun can really be revealed. So it's the act of destruction of those things that says, you know, go and be a light. Go and be Messiah to the nations. Well, that's not going to happen unless you destroy the sin and the darkness in your life. That's part of the concealing and the revealing. You've got to be able to have that happen in you. So the process of concealment has to be in place before our salvation or salvation could never have taken place. That's why so many years, many of us, we didn't know Elohim. Because the part of concealment has to be in place first so that then there can be the revelation. And that's when you start then to have the cleansing. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to Yahuwah, our Elohim. But those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may then do all the words of this Torah. So the person these people are seeing as Yahuwah the, is who? The revealed arm, Yahusha. So he pre-existed way before Bethlehem, right? Doing the work of the Father. 
So we have the two Yahuwahs, a duality of powers, not persons, the concealed Yahuwah and the revealed Yahuwah, one Echad in heaven, and Yahusha, who is fully equal as the revealed Yahuwah, yet, here we go, he is eternally under the concealed Yahuwah. There's the greater and lesser principle. Right? My father is greater than I, but he is equally Yahuwah. <laughs> So here's four questions that the Bible asks, and here's four answers to these questions. And it's in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Now, in the words of Agur, son of Jachar of Massa, number one, who has ascended to heaven and who has descended? Number two, who has established the ends of the earth? Number three, what is his name? Number four. And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Well, apparently the synagogue of Satan doesn't. So Yahushua replies to the first question in John chapter 3, verse 13. Who has ascended to heaven and who has descended? No one. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from the heavens, the Son of Man. Daniel the prophet in the grave. Where's Abraham? In the grave. Where's great-grandma Betty, who was a devout believer, in the grave? Because we haven't had the resurrection yet. But when he comes, the dead in Messiah will rise, and then all that remain shall be caught up with them. It's not difficult, but it sure is difficult to overcome the programming and brainwashing, isn't it? When you go to a funeral and you're like, that, that guy was wicked. Oh, they're in heaven. And you're like, oh, good night, please. <laughs> right? God, he was a wicked sinner. They're burning it. No, right, anyway. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Nobody has ascended to the heavens. Now, Yahushua is and refers, of course, to himself throughout scriptures as the ben Adam, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. He was in the beginning with Elohim, and all things came to existence through him, and without him nothing could be whatsoever. John 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You see, this is what the synagogue of Satan does. They think by doing all the Torah observance and coming into that, that's how you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. So throughout the Torah, you should see, throughout the Tanakh, you should see the revealed Yahuwah because they bear witness to me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Because you don't get to see the concealed Yahuwah. The only way you get to experience Yahuwah is through the revealed Yahuwah. I know that you have not the love of Yahuwah within you. For I have come in my Father's name. Not in some papal Roman God's name. Not in some, but in my Father's name. You're going to hear the name of the Father in the name of the Son. And you do not receive me. Now, if another comes in his own name, you could make up another name. Everyone's going to love it because it's going to be of another gospel. It's going to be super convenient. You can just kind of do it for an hour on Sunday and then you can go back and... Uh, do your secular work week and not worry about it. It's super convenient. And you can have a form of godliness and kind of feel good about yourself because you're kind of in the culture of religion and you can go, oh, I'm going to heaven. But, but that's not reality. It might be your reality, but it's not a saving reality. You've actually deceived yourself. And that's the problem. Because you can kind of make yourself feel good because everybody will pat you on the back and say, it's okay, you're in the club. It's good to go. You're going to go to heaven. And there's the problem. It's got the form of godliness, but again, it's on the other side of the aisle. It's denying its power. For if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Do not think that I shall come and accuse you to the Father. It is Moses who accuses you, on whom you have set your hope. 
If you believe the words of Moshe, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. And we've experienced those scriptures, haven't we? But if you do not believe his writings, how on earth are you going to believe my words? So we've just read some of the scriptures that he's talking about, replete with references to the angel of Yahuwah, Yahusha, who has the ability to forgive sins and who has the name of Yahuwah in him. That's paramount. This is the almighty Elohim, the plural monotheism, plural Yahuwah Elohim and his son, his namesake, Yahusha ben Yahuwah Elohim. Yahushua, the son of Yahuwah Elohim. Even the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels are also of the Elohim family, aren't they? And Elohim means it's a disembodied spirit. That's what the Psalm 82 is about. There's a council of disembodied spirit. There's Elohim. There are many Elohim, but there is only one creator Elohim, which is a compound unity. All the other Elohim were created. So there's a bunch of rogue Elohim out there, okay? They're the ones that influence Islam. They're the ones that influence Hinduism, many, many. These are the rebel Elohim that rebelled with Satan. They really are gods. They're the gods of this world that are enemies to the throne of Yahuwah. So when you see people that are demon-possessed or they're in Hinduism with their million different gods... Are they, oh, they're not really gods. No, they really are gods. Then none of them were ever the creator Elohim, but they are fallen Elohim. They are deceptive powers and principalities that we're at war against. And where do you think all the politicians, the New World Order, do you think, I mean, they know what they're doing. They are worshipping the fallen rebel Elohim I mean, now you go watch Star Wars and it's going to really make a lot more sense to you. I mean, this, that, that, where do you think they're getting all this stuff from? It's the rebel Elohim that they are worshipping and then the rebel Elohim are giving them limited powers to be able to operate in their occult sphere. It's usually got pedophilia and sexual immorality and all kinds of abominations that goes with it. And it has been that way from the beginning. The sacrifice of children to one of those rebel Elohim, of course, is Molech, right? Which is the symbol of the owl. How many times when my kids were younger and I wanted to go and get my daughters like some sleepwear and it's got a bloody owl on it. And I'm like, why? You go and buy some sheets for your kid's bed and it's got an owl on it. Why? You go to Target just to, you know, do up your nursery. Blooming owls. Why do you think? Because that Elohim, that rebel Elohim, wants the children. Always has. I remember somebody coming into the congregation and their daughter had this massive big owl. I'm like, okay, that person, that family needs some deliverance because they haven't waken up to the truth of the principality that is over that particular family. So we have to be careful what we bring into our house. No graven images, that type of thing, because there are strongholds that go with it. So I'm very serious about that. Anyway, I'm rambling, but that's four cups of coffee deep. John 5, 43, I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me, but if another comes in his own name, you'll be all happy clappy and you'll congregate once a week for about 20 minutes for the sermon and a few good songs and you'll think you're good to go. Then when you die, you'll go to a nice funeral and everybody will lie to you and say, oh, hell yeah, John Bloggs went up to heaven. Right? There we go. And you can live your life as you want and you're happy and you can pat yourself on your back because you think you're... You're secure and you have salvation. What a lie from the pit of hell. Truly. So Yahusha means Yahuwah saves. Yahusha comes in Yahuwah's name. It's a double portion. John 17, 25. Oh, my Zadik, my righteous father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you have sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will yet declare it 
so that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Because the only way you're going to experience the Father's love is by experiencing all of his goodness that will pass before you as you're hidden in the cleft of the rock. Because if you're not hidden in the cleft of the rock, you'd get the judgment. Matthew 5.19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel at this. It is a marvelous revelation, isn't it? So the Father and Son are truly in one accord in everything that they do. However, it's obvious that the Father and Son are not in the same substance, are they? The Son came down in bodily form, revealed. The Father is Ruach, concealed. Clearly, we're dealing with two of the compound unity, Father and Son working together together on a building, aren't they? The Father and Son are working together on a building of unity and oneness. Matthew 16, 17. And Yahushua, in answering, said to him, Blessed are you, Shimon, Shimon ben Yonah, Simon son of Jonah, for body and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. I also tell you, you are a stone. That's the masculine there word in the Greek. So upon this stone, now he switches to the feminine, I will build a home. I'm going to build a house for my called out ones and the gates of hell, they will not succeed against it. So the whole premise for this Passover teaching on the truth or Trinity is so that the gates of hell will not conquer you in your faith because the synagogue of the Satan is actually ramping up through the Messianic and Hebrew Roots movement to lead more and more people astray because eventually they become so enamored with everything Hebraic that they lose sight of the duality of power. And they're listening to apostate rabbis that have a form of godliness, yet deny its power. The letter of the Torah kills. But it's the spirit of the Torah revealed right? Through the Son that saves. So something is to be built. It's a house. It's a rock. It's a stone. It's the hiding place in the cleft of the rock for the end time saints. That's what Yahweh is doing. He's preparing a hiding place for us in these end times. So there's of course the Greek word Petra which means rock or stone and cliff. And Petra, you know, we've all heard about it. It's actually a city on the east bank of the Jordan where the early believers gathered for refuge and where they gathered for safety, where they gathered for worship, where some even today are actually preparing to leave to. So Yahushua is saying that Petros, which is the man is the house builder, and Petra, which is the feminine form, is the place where it would be built, a place of protection from attack, a place of protection from accusation. Psalms 8, verse 3. When I look at thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars that thou hast established, who is man? that thou art mindful of him, and the Son of Man, 
that thou dost care for him, yet thou hast made him a little less than the Elohim and dost crown him with kavod, glory and honor. So the writer of Hebrews interprets this passage identifying Yahushua as this revealed man. Hebrews 2 verse 6. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that thou art mindful of him? I just read to you where it was from. Or the son of man that thou carest for him, thou didst make him a little lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Even the apostle Paul, speaking of his position with the Father, makes it clear that Yahushua is under a lesser than the Father. Romans 8 verse 29. For whom did he foreknow? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Those being brothers, right, of the family of Elohim. We're brought into the family of Elohim. Colossians 1 verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins? who is the image of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, and he is before all things, and by him all things are in existence. Such a powerful scripture. So Yahushua and Yahuwah, son and father, here are identified together as the two Yahuwahs by comparing myramids upon myramids of Hebrew with Greek scriptures with the same subject, Yahuwah's return. Yahuwah concealed, Yahuwah revealed his arm of salvation. Even the prophet Zechariah, chapter 1, chapter 14, verse th 3 says thus, then shall Yahuwah go forth, and he shall fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand, stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem upon the east. And on the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great deep valley, and half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and the other half of it towards the south. So if this is to be taken literally, then it can only be who? <coughs> Yah ben Adam. Yah, the son of man, is standing <coughs> on the mountains. Anthropomorphic Yahweh revealed in the lower dimensions. Hands, feet, mouth, eating, drinking, and splitting the Mount of Olives. It's the revelation of the Messiah. Revelation 19.11, finishing up here. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that was sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture that was dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of Yahuwah. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon a white horse clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that which he should smite the nations with. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Elohim El Shaddai. And he hath on his vesture and on his banner a name written, King of kings and sovereign of sovereigns. Two more grammatical 
plurality that can be translated the greatest king and the most powerful sovereign. It's the plurality of divinity, the plurality of powers. It is plural monotheism in all its power that the religions of this world just don't want you to know. The truth is that Yahuwah and Yahusha are different powers. Just like I am different from my own father. And that Yahuwah and Yahusha bore the same name. Just as I and my earthly father bore the same name. Yet Yahuwah and Yahusha were always and have been echad together in unity of purpose, in unity of mission, and in unity of character. I am Yahuwah and I change not. You cannot have a New Testament that is in contradiction to the Old Testament. You have to have Torah, Nevim, Ketuvim, and the New Testament. Torah, prophets, writings, and New Testament in complete threaded harmony, and it is the blood-tipped thread of the sun that makes it all come together in perfect harmony through the Malkitzedic priesthood. Because as the Father is working, the Son is working. They're not working against one another. Yahusha is working on the same mission and intercession upon our behalf. It also shows us, of course, that Yahusha existed way before Bethlehem. But he was very active in the affairs of humankind all the way back at the Oaks of Mamre. See, lots of messianic ministries have abandoned the belief that Yahusha existed before Bethlehem. And it is very, very obvious that through what we have studied over these past few days, that Yahusha was the messenger of Yahuwah and his son, Yahuwah revealed in the lower realm, acting as region and agent on behalf of Yahuwah concealed in the upper realm. Echad in purpose, Echad in origin, Echad in divinity. There is only one Elohim. It's plural monotheism. Finishing up with Psalms chapter 2. I will declare the decree Yahweh hath said to me, You're my son, and this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for my possession. I was a heathen, and now I am part of Yahushua's inheritance. You were heathen, and he has made us part of that inheritance. And that inheritance is that you are a royal kingdom of Malkitzedic priests under the authority of the Malkitzedic Kohen Haggadah, high priest himself. You are my son, the beloved, and this day I have begotten you. Throughout the scripture, there's always been two. <coughs> there was two spies with a good report. There's two houses that bring in the whole. There's two righteous menorahs. There's two olive trees. There's two end time witnesses. And there's two Yahuwahs working together in Echad plurality. I've got goosebumps. <laughs> I truly do. Because I know that this message is going to prevent one sheep, I pray many more, from going to the slaughter of the synagogue of Satan. And then that makes everything worthwhile. And we're a part of this ministry together. The ministry is the people. And that we have the responsibility to go forth and proclaim this truth of the Malkitzedic priesthood to the nations and gather in at these feasts. Torah to the tribes is you. 
It's you. It's you. We are the exiled tribes coming in through the revealed Yahweh. Amen? I think we have some questions, some questions from our online audience. Let's see what we've got there in the back. Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Where are we? 314. Oh, yeah, okay, here we go. Exodus 3, 14. Mm. And Elohim said to Moshe, Eyer, Asher, Eyer. Aleph, Yah, I am Yah. I am Yah. Go tell them Yah has sent me to you. What is that? That's the plurality of Divinity. Verse 15. Tell me, tell me. Do we have a microphone for let's have a we got another one. Oh perfect. Yeah, read that. Verse 15 goes on to say a little further. He says, Moreover, Elohim said to Moshe, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Yahuwah, Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob has sent me to you. And you verse part here, This is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. Yeah. So if we really break this down, Aleph Yah, I am Yah, right? I am Yah, now go and tell them, Yah has sent me to you. It's the plurality, one concealed, now one being revealed to them. The Father sending forth the revealed as what? The messenger, the malak, the captain of Yahweh's hosts. That's what we see throughout the Tanakh until the full revelation and the full revealing that is the Son. Excellent question. Yes, in the back. Then Mark says, how do we count three days in a day? Passover is the 14th, leavened bread starts on the 15th. When does the three days stop? <laughs> I love the Passover three days and three night questions. And quite honestly, I'm not going to be able to answer that to you right now. In a it would take a teaching. I have gone to big festivals, Sukkot festivals, where people have come up to me with literally slide graphs and everything. And there are so many different interpretations of how you get the three days. What you're doing at this point is you're starting to get into calculations and calendar. And we all know that everybody's right and everybody's wrong. The only person that's right is the person that really believes there's right. All I know is that he spent three nights and three days in the ground and that he rose. And that is what I'm sticking with. But as far as trying to calendar it, I have seen all kinds of calendars of when the three days and the three nights are. And you know what? They're all good because somebody put a lot of thought, a lot of time into their calculations. And usually my mind goes, boom. And then somebody comes along with an even better one. And then my mind goes, boom. And then I get confused. So I know I'm a simple man with a simple faith that my Messiah died, that he was in the grave for three days, and that he did not see decay. And he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. So, I laid down that so many years ago, because 
that's just me. I've got other things that I would rather spend my time on than calculating things. Because ultimately I know that when it's time for him to reveal something, he's going to reveal it to his servants, right? But if somebody really enjoys calculating that type of stuff, then great. I'm sure I'll see you at the next feast with a slide chart. <laughs> Another question. And just a comment here is um, wonderful, powerful message, excellent, timely message. Thank you, people. For oh, praise you. Yahweh. And thank you all out there for listening in. We've had over 3,000 people watching over the past few days with all the video out there. So it's pretty amazing, isn't it? So Yahweh is good and every man is a stinking liar. We'll catch you <laughs> on Shabbat live stream. Amen. Bless you.